But usually in Capital, they take you 5 or 10% of the company only to give you like 100,000 or 50,000. But now, uh, for some of the, uh, this is just rumor, some of the company, some of the startups funding company in Thailand, uh, they wanted like 30% for 50,000 dollars or 100,000 dollars. So they, they are a little bit, like, like, you know, I have the money, so it's in the yeah. So I think along the way, since from pitching and then going around and then start seeing in front of the investor, I identify four different kinds of people, four different kinds of investors. The first one is this kind. The investor usually probably come from a, they have a big, like 200 million or 300 million investment. Uh, portfolio, but they, the guy who is talking to you has never been in a small company before. He cannot understand your pain. They, they came from like a post holding firm and they have been in Citibank and then they moved into a VCR, uh, managing this 300 million portfolio, uh, portfolio and then they will, they will invest in you. I'm not saying he's, he's, this guy is bad, you know, maybe, but, but sometimes they won't understand your perspective. They won't get what you're feeling. So I usually avoid this guy, especially Chinese and Taiwanese <laughs> investors. I've, I've been in one of the pitch. So I, I pitch in front of this Chinese uh, VC and with, through translator. After, after I've pitched for about five minutes, he told me, no, 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 this is not going to work. This is going to completely fail. And, but I can help you, then you will become very, very successful, but you have to follow my way. I said, no, this is my product idea. No, no, this is wrong. You follow me, then we invest. So I thought, okay, thank you very much. Another one is very nice, always very nice. They will come and tell you, oh, you know, give me more data. Your company looks very good. So these guys are, I call them part of the NATO group. So, so they are very nice. They will take you out for dinner, they will take you for lunch, talk for hours, drain your time, and then and basically they only talk and do action. <laughs> and there, sometimes I see this kind of thoughts. They will come and say to me, my boss is a big one, but I cannot tell you his name. He has billions of dollars. I am ready to put money tomorrow. Sign this. So there are so many. In Asia, I see a bunch of them. And they will come and tell you, oh, we have a company in, you know, the BVI. We have billions of dollars behind us. It spoils money and, you know, it's Russian money and all that. But <laughs> <laughs> they cannot identify the source of funds. So, you know, it's not a good idea to go with them. So these are VC, and let's say you go through this jungle, and then finally you have some VC funding received and you have you have passed your expansion stage and then you want to go a little bit more strategic. If, if you may notice, some of our investors are strategic, uh, like MasterCard is one of that, we are a payment company, we are a payment company, and MasterCard is way bigger than ours. You will see like GMO, they are also a payment company, we are a payment company. So sometimes, dealing with them can be like swimming with the shark. Because in our world, we eat, so if someone is smaller, we can inquire them. But if we are smaller, they can inquire us. But sometimes they can inquire us before we think we are ready to inquire. And sometimes the return will be less than what we are expecting to get out of this. So we have to be very careful about this. And, and, and especially for me personally, I'm at this very particular stage where I'm really swimming together with the shop. I receive like monthly uh, inquiries to discuss about potential acquisition, and, and that's that's sometimes scares me. I thought that we could take this forward for three more years. We think that we can grow it bigger, but now now the the timing of acquisition is the movement in a mind, particularly in my industry, is moving very very fast. So this is so when you are doing this, when you are at this stage, please remember this. So. At the same time, I mean, I'm in the same position. Sometimes when I go to a, a little bit less developed than our country, 
I am looking at some of the smaller companies for potential acquisition from our supply partner so that we can grow faster. So I'm sure these big wise also think in the same way like I am. So, so this, is, uh, this is where we are today. And once you are at this stage, or if you are already at this stage, please be careful who you deal with, uh, which strategic investment you take. So because of you are taking their investment, sometimes they, are, they, they, they can begin with your bar, which is a good thing, no, not a bad thing. But we have to make sure we time it correctly so that acquisition is you know, fruitful and maximized. But sometimes they have the information right, so they know what your move is next. So sometimes it may not be good because sometimes they, they, they know too much. Um, but we are obligated to provide them the information because they are investing. So, so we have, you have to make sure those are, those are intact. And also sometimes the investment comes with a commercial obligation. So they will tell you, okay, we we'll invest in you, but you have to use, prefer to this particular brand only if you are transacting something. So this can happen. So in different kinds of industry, this can happen also. So make sure you are aware of those and make sure you don't overcommit if you receive investment from the strategy. So here are my recommendations from my mind. This is the chart as an MBA chart. So all the things I just mentioned earlier. So time, complexity, and amount. So if you are, if you want very short time, this is time. This is complexity, and this is amount uh, estimate. You know, it can be different amount based on a different region. If you want immediate, in nearly immediate terms, but a little bit money, friends and family, or sometimes they call it yeah. And then a little bit higher, angel and angel group. It can be one individual or group of individuals. And then VC fund. And then strategy. Strategy is the most complex. Sometimes if you get it correctly and if you get it right, it can mean a lot. Because if they are with you and they can become your potential position uh, Next, if I look at it from the, this is the industry norm. If you look at it from the revenue, this is a revenue line, a little bit complex, uh, excuse me. This is the capital requirement, this is where you are at, this is the revenue line, this is your current profitability, this is the risk level from the VC point of view. So friends and family, obviously, I mean, uh, before profitability, angels and VC is before profitability line, and then revenue start coming in. And then, I didn't talk about PE today, I mean, uh, because I don't think it is, uh, it is the, the, the right topic. Uh, this is another story. Uh, this is a PE firm trying to investment. PE is more like a, uh, in Lehman term, and in my term I know, it's like loaning money from the, uh, from the bank, but it is uh, from the private equity firm. And then we can see the IPO as a peak revenue. So this is the industry norm. No company fall into this norm. This is just theory right norm. And I think at least I should project it. So you know, I don't know, this is the industry. So, but remember, uh, the top 20 reason or whatever, you know, reason for the entrepreneur uh, to fail, I mean, failure is always 85% for the entrepreneur, so only 15% success. And there are, you know, a lot of reasons. And one of them is not cash, so getting cash is really important. But I, I hope everybody wants to be an uh, entrepreneur or everybody wants to be uh, the founder of a company so, or a startup CEO. But it sounds cool, it sounds uh, nice, but for the past 13 years, I've been feeling this and let me share with you. I feel that I feel a lot because we really feel a lot. So uh, usually I feel 15% of most of the time because every two decisions I make, one of them is wrong. And nobody likes me. Really nobody likes me. Because at one stage my family hates me because I have too much time spending in the office. At one stage my, my, my team hates me because I push them too much. At one stage my, uh, my customer hates me because I didn't deliver a good enough uh, solution. At one stage everybody hates you. So you have to live with it. If, if, if you cannot live with it, it's tough. And I'm always worried about things. You are always worried that your team will leave you in the middle of the project. You're always worried that 
your customer will not pay you, you always worry that your investor will fire you and then put a new CEO, you always worry. And, and if you become a startup CEO, you will always worry. And you will always see the constant betrayal, your team disappear, there is a, your customer headhunting your lead developers and, and you will see that your partner company will take your, uh, your, your, your colleague away. So many happenings, I mean, plenty of stuff. And you're always behind, you're always catching up. There's so much things to do, so much ahead of you. You're always behind in email, you're always behind in, you know, uh, project items. So if you have 10 projects planned for it and you, you, you thought that you will finish this year and you will always overrun your time up. It's always behind. And, and, and I'm always behind. I'm always behind my email, always, always behind. And if you become one, you will always be behind. Uh, you will never be a good person. And every time I see I'm selling and selling and selling. If I'm having dinner and I'm selling, like I'm, if I'm, you know, meeting with somebody, I'm selling my product. Every time I'll be selling and selling and selling all the time. So so that's that's our life. So if you want to be in it, welcome. So <laughs> but at the end of the day we truly enjoy uh, what we are and I think that being an entrepreneur is more fun to be in a big lot of breaks. So um, if you really like it, you know, I welcome you to our entrepreneur world. So and thank you for all your time and thank you for listening to me. And um, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Yes. If you can recall the first ever uh, successful pitch of your own, what do you think uh, did right or did you do wrong? What was the successful factor? In fact, you know, when for my presentation deck, for the investor deck, I was trained like a robot. I will. I can repeat every single word, every single time. If you, you know, it's all the time. So, I think it is not because of my pitch. It is more like connection I make between the investor and myself, or probably my team member. Personal connection. I mean, selling investment is like like uh, telling a girl I love you. You know, it's it's really the personal connection. There's someone really need to like you personally, only then they will like the product or company. And in fact, the team and the founder is more important than, than the product or the pitch itself. It, based on, you will feel it once you get connected. But it's, 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 it's hard. It's, it's, it's not about projection, it's not about, it's a little bit influenced there, but if they hate you, no money. So be humble, make sure you give your, when, you, when someone is speaking with passion, they can see it, they can feel it, and they can think. So you have to, you have to project. What's your ambition right now? Because you grown like you're pretty successful, and you mentioned that there's a lot of uh, proposal for position. Oh yeah, okay, by all means, I'm not, the company itself is still startups. We are still struggling day in the hour. And when I started it, uh, like I indicated to you, just to give better life for my family. That, that was all. Because I didn't have, let's change the wall and then come in and start doing this. No. Uh, so, but now uh, my motivation changed a little bit. Now that my family is uh, safe and sound, and then they, they got what they needed. So now what I would like to do is I would like to transform the Sony stage of payment landscape a little bit. Because if you really look at it from the payment industry itself, um, European and Americans and all that have a very developed market, very well structured market. And if you really look at the cost structure, the way they, they, they control the cost is in such a way that Sony Asia banks will never become a global player because every time, okay, Let's say you are a bank in US and your cost of charging a credit card is like about 1%. If you are a bank in Thailand, your cost of charging a credit card is 2.1%. This cost is controlled by Visa and MasterCard. They are, they are payment, you know, the processor of payment scheme. That one is a serious price discrimination. It's the same service that it is happening. And because of that, 
if the US processor serve one of our airlines here or one of our merchant here, they cost it cheap. And no way that uh, uh, Asia Bank can compete. It's not because of technology, it's because of the price discrimination. This is just one example. There are so many this kind of uh, issues. So I would really like to fix that. Right now, Central Bank and around the Southeast Asia have identified that now they will tell. And they know what is going on. So uh, so they are, they are doing something. And I would like to make sure we contribute a little bit about that. So they don't worry about price discrimination or like uh, other player being uh, influencing uh, our payment transaction. So if you put yourself in the bank of hand issues, okay, let me give you an example. You have a credit card from Kong Bank. I, I have a restaurant, for example. I have a credit card machine from Bangkok Bank. You come to me and then, you know, buy dinner. I charge your card. Transition go through Visa. Two Thai guy transact in. They make ten cents. I mean, uh, doesn't make sense from Bangkok China point of view. If you are from Singapore and then you come and buy at a Thai restaurant, it makes sense for Visa to make ten cents because it is a cross border, really added value. But between two Thai enterprise or between two Thai entity transacting locally is is tough to, to to be able to do that. And in Thailand, I mean you will see you know a lot of transition happening and every single time two Thai entity transact, someone else is getting something. This is just one example. There are, there are a few more. Oh. Maybe that's uh, there are choices. Uh, there are choices now. Uh, the, from the regulatory point of view, they can control. For example, a country like Australia control it. So they, they call this domestic switching. You know, I don't want to go into the very technical thing about it. So domestic switching allows you to transact domestically if two parties is a domestic. So the service fees will continue to pay. Visa and Master will still get what they will, what you know for, for for they will still get a fee, but not like ten cents. You know, they will they will get what they should get. So there should be two tier pricing. One is the domestic switching, another one is the international switching. It's, uh, we are not against Visa and Master at all, by all means. We simply want to I mean, the, the Bank of Thailand and all that the community here would like to make sure that there's a tier pricing so that you know the, 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 so the domestic cost can be reduced. If domestic costs are reduced, across the board, you know, people can transact more, more business can join in. All I meant to say about well, they are trading trade because they are trading something of value, so they are not there. For now, like you said, until now they were not charged, now they are not charged. But they were providing the service and they were getting paid for it. That's true. Like a good people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Does, does your company offer very sophisticated processing to um, startups? If I have an idea and I want to take money from customers, and specifically for a digital service, Okay, uh, for the past three years, uh, what we have been doing is, because of the way our team is structured, we try to filter who we serve. But now we are changing a little bit, because our support team is not designed to, designed to uh, serve a smaller entity. I'm not saying that startups are small, but what I mean is, uh, it takes some time from the support team every time we add a new merchant. So now we are we are, we are aware of uh, this particular uh, needs. So we are launching a new product around September or October. That is more started from the uh, uh, the SME fund. Will you be supporting companies outside of Thailand? Yes, we will be supporting every company where we are located. At. We are located in eight different Southeast Asian country. So we always support all of that. Keep selling. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question regarding the external funding again. You showed uh, the development uh, to, to say uh, family, friends, and foods. And the second uh, phase was the change of investors. Yes. Uh, I would be interested how did you approach that? There was a slide uh, where you then showed that they helped you also. Um, the license, mm -hmm. and uh, but due to my knowledge, 
people are not so easy when they do the rating of your, your, your credit. And then on top, they do the, the consulting for the license. So somebody did do that, was that a cold call, or you had the contacts uh, networking? It is all like cold call. At the time, uh, my found, my co-founder and I, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he, he quit from KeyBank. At the time, he was the manager from KeyBank. So the story was uh, like, uh, I can project that slide so uh, everybody can. The story was like that. Uh, his name is Cho. Uh, he was at the time uh, assistant, general, assistant manager or manager of the Casicom Bank, responsible for e-commerce business. At the time, um, my company, the very first company I started, is already serving KeyBank. So we, I have a relationship with him as a vendor, and the you know I, I'm the supplier, and he is, uh, he is the owner of the business. And then he told me one day that all uh, the the PayPal came and see me. He, he wanted to start PayPal Thailand. The Bank of Thailand regulation do not allow it. We do not have e-money license. So I think it would be a good one. Can we start? So I told him, if you quit your job and if you run a business, I'll write the code for you. So that's how we get started. So uh, he, he owed 51% of the company. I owe 49% of the company. I became a techie guy developing based on my line one. And then, over time, we, we found out that we really need money to go and seek for it. We go everywhere we can. We were really, really desperate. So we went to the, at the time, Thailand's only funding, uh, they, they have sort of like VC at the time. We went there, we pitch, we give them the projection and everything. I don't remember the name, but they, they are one of the, one of the very, very uh, recognized name. Uh, never get money. I mean, and they, Half of the people we met, they will say, you guys are crazy, Bank of Thailand will come and shut you down. The other half will say, you guys are just 27 years old, two, you know, two kids, who will put money in your system? So there's no positive feedback from anybody. And then we keep going and going, so we went to every single executive of the mobile operator. So we end up talking to two executive of mobile operator. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the senior executives from the true said, if we give up 80% of our company, the key will invest. So we 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 keep we each hold 10% and then you will invest. So so it's all this <laughs> because he has the money. So basically, so all this going on, and then we've met, uh, likely met a group of investors. Uh, he is also related to True, but I I don't want to mention names. I mean, we we can do private. Uh, and then he was really really. Uh, logical. He is uh, he is Wharton graduate. He is, uh, he is he's a PhD Wharton, and then his group of people uh, really you know recognize that name. Finally, say okay, these guys have the potential, and finally they injected about 15 million baht I think at the time. It was a lot of money at the time, and then and then we keep the ball rolling. When we received 15 million baht, we give away 50 baht for a month, and then we accumulated to 100 uh, thousand customer immediately. And then once we have one thousand customers, Bank of Thailand not allowed all. And then they say, oh, by the way, guys, you are not regulated. Uh, but we thought that they would shut us down. So we were like, oh, begging, please don't. They said, no, we won't shut you down because we want to protect the customer account. So we will regulate you. But can you allow one of our officers to sit in your office and see how you operate so that we can write e-money license? I said, yeah, hell yes. <laughs> and then they came. They, they, they wrote the, the licensing, we are the e-money license number one holder, and, and the rest is the rest of the history. Oh, one more question. Uh, when you were at this angel investor, um, did he evaluate you based on gut feeling, or did he have, or she has, um, analysts, like the credit department, for example, or bank? No, they, they are wealthy individuals like Nick, for example. <laughs> It just <laughs> they look at the business, a projection made by this two twenty six years old guy. We at the time we have no training whatsoever to do financial projection or whatever. They just look at it and say, Okay and one week later we get on them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So that's the benefit of talking to agents. I mean, sometimes they can be crazy and they just throw in the money. So when you are uh, looking for funding, uh, on that time, I mean, uh, your company's equity is nothing but a promise. I yes. Find. So how can you get to a valuation for that company? How can you? Uh, you will learn from the incubator uh, how to do that. So what you can do is you can you can define the projection. Of course, every projection is projection. So. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make sure that you are you are passionate enough and you are trustworthy enough to move this forward. And whatever you are saying in front of them and your team and all this, you know, everything surrounding it is realistic enough. Everybody knows it's not real. Everybody knows projection is not real as well. But they have to look into your eyes and make sure you don't give up. And so, yeah. So, so, but. Projection definitely helps. And if you are in the industry, especially if you are cloning someone, like, like in, in our case, we are cloning paper, by all means. We are really cloning paper. In our early version, menu is one on one. We just go into paper and then design it. <laughs> so we don't need. <laughs> and, and they know paper is a surfer at the time. So they have a reference. So if paper is a $1 billion company, maybe we can make maybe like $10 million. So at least you know we can scale it down a little bit. So they can refer to it. So if you're starting a new idea, uh, as you know, 99.9% .9 of the ideas are no longer new. So you will always have a reference somewhere. And if you can indicate that reference and why you can be better and why you will be, you will be good at execution, and then, then they will let you pitch. So what is the Ideas are worthless. Yeah, ideas are worthless. So if you tell someone that I have an idea, I can tell you if you sign an NDA, something is wrong. Because your idea, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you may have a good idea, but I am, today I'm convinced that not all the ideas are new. Unless you are creating a like, rocket or space case something else, I mean, uh, especially IT product, all the payment process we are doing today, they're not new. I mean, everybody knows about it. It's execution is the key. And in especially our business, payment business, is commoditized, heavily commoditized. In order for us to differentiate, we have to make sure our support is right, execution is right. It's not about great idea. At the end of the day, execution matters, team matters. You were mentioning that uh, pitching is not to uh, see the contract, it's to get the second meeting. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the second meeting? Usually, if your pitch is well structured, if your pitch the pitch is well defined, and if you are pitching like a robot, I mean, like a robot, you are pitching precisely, every, if you are pitching every single keyword, they know you have spent enough time and effort to come to this meeting. So at least they give, they appreciate your effort, and most of the time they will they will give you a second chance or second meeting to further discuss more. At second meeting, you won't pitch anymore. At second meeting, you will be showing your Excel sheet or you will be showing rejection and all that. So it always helps to have a well structured pitch deck, and where you will be you know spending a lot of time in front of the mirror talking. Right now, sort of like holding company, 
we have 14 different entities and a Singapore entity. So if you look at, uh, and our operation in each country has a different stage. Our time operation is very major, our premise operation is major. If you look at this operation in silo, they are a profitable company. If you look at the whole group in currently, it's not profitable at all. That's why we raise money. Because we are in expanding stage in other parts of the country. So we made, I mean this is public information, we made $4.2 million last year. Uh, 